Please turn in Holy Scripture to Galatians chapter 4. I'm going to take the time to read the entire chapter and then we'll plunge in. Galatians chapter 4, turn in your Bible or on your Bible as the case may be. Hear then what Scripture says. What I am saying is that as long as an heir is underage, he is no different from a slave, although he owns the whole estate. The heir is subject to guardians and trustees until the time set by his father. So also when we were underage, we were in slavery under the elemental spiritual forces of the world. But when the set time had fully come, God sent His Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law that we might receive adoption to sonship. Because you are His sons, God sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, the Spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but God's child. And since you are his child, God has made you also an heir. Formerly, when you did not know God, you were slaves to those who by nature are not gods. But now that you know God, or rather are known by God, how is it that you are turning back to those weak and miserable forces? Do you wish to be enslaved by them all over again? You are observing special days and months and seasons and years. I fear for you that somehow I have wasted my efforts on you. I plead with you, brothers and sisters, come, become like me, for I became like you. You did me no wrong. As you know, it was because of an illness that I first preached the gospel to you. And even though my illness was a trial to you, you did not treat me with contempt or scorn. Instead, you welcomed me as if I were an angel of God, as if I were Christ Jesus Himself. Where then is your blessing of me now? I can testify that if you could have done so, you would have torn out your eyes and given them to me. Have I now become your enemy by telling you the truth? Those people are zealous to win you over, but for no good. What they want is to alienate you from us, so that you may have zeal for them. It is fine to be zealous, provided the purpose is good, and to be so always, not just when I am with you. My dear children, for whom I am again in the pains of childbirth until Christ is formed in you, how I wish I could be with you now and change my tone because I am perplexed about you. Tell me, you who want to be under the law, are you not aware of what the law says? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by the slave woman and the other by the free woman. His son by the slave woman was born according to the flesh, but his son by the free woman was born as the result of a divine promise. These things are being taken figuratively. The women represent two covenants. One covenant is from Mount Sinai and bears children who are to be slaves. This is Hagar. Now Hagar stands for Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to the present city of Jerusalem because she is in slavery with her children. But the Jerusalem that is above is free and she is our mother. For it is written, Be glad, barren woman, you who never bore a child, Shout for joy and shout aloud, you who are never in labor, because more are the children of the desolate woman than of her who has a husband. Now you, brothers and sisters, like Isaac, are children of promise. At that time, the son born according to the flesh persecuted the son born by the power of the Spirit. It is the same now. But what does Scripture say? Get rid of the slave woman and her son, for the slave woman's son will never share in the inheritance with the free woman's son. 
Therefore, brothers and sisters, we are not children of the slave woman, but of the free woman. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. For Jesus' sake, amen. Many voices in Western culture view Christianity as an enslaving religion. It loves to tell us what we can and cannot do. It treats us like children, like slaves. This stance has been given fresh and articulate life in the writings of Charles Taylor, Canadian cultural commentator who has written numerous influential books. In his volume, A Secular Age, he says that one of the things that characterize contemporary secularism is our commitment to authenticity. And by authenticity, he is referring to living out your self-chosen identity. So you can choose what you want to be. You can choose your identity. You can choose your race now, according to some people. You can choose your gender. You can choose your lifestyle. You can choose your vision of marriage. You can choose your economic goals. You can, you can choose your nationalism. You can, you can choose anything. And no matter what it is, provided you live in line with it, that's commendable. That's what makes you authentic. But intrinsically, of course, such a stance is anti-authoritarian. Under such a regime, small wonder that Christianity seems narrow, limiting, twisted, enslaving, because here there is a, an identity that is bound up with Christ. It's not a self-chosen identity. It's, it's committed under the Lordship of Christ. We confess King Jesus. Of course, in some ways, this is nothing new. Augustine in the fourth century feared becoming a Christian because he thought it would cut off his pleasures. Only after he was converted could he look back and state the sublime truth that we human beings are restless until we find our rest in God. Or as one of the converts of the 1970s put it in this country, after he had burned himself out, choosing to do whatever he wanted in every arena of life. He said, we took what we wanted, and then we found we no longer wanted what we took. And suddenly, freedom and slavery do not seem like such easy tags after all that you can throw around thoughtlessly. You pursue freedom and discover you are, you are enslaved. You pursue a certain kind of slavery and you expand into a great and glorious gospel freedom. According to the Bible, what starts off looking like the most amazing freedom regularly ends up as the bitter slavery of defeat, despair, in brief, enslavement. And what appears to be a religion of slavery turns out to be the glorious freedom of the sons and daughters of God. Now, in our chapter, Galatians 4, Paul introduces us to fresh dimensions of the antithesis between slavery and freedom in order to further his exposition of the gospel of grace. These fresh dimensions of the antithesis between slavery and freedom, he anchors in the Old Testament itself. We are to understand the text aright. Look at verse 21. Tell me, you who want to be under the law, are you not aware what the law says? Or again, verse 30, but what does Scripture say? So he is anchoring his analysis of the antitheses in the biblical text itself. <clears throat> I think it will be helpful to follow the thought of this chapter in three parts. Number one, 
the glory of turning from enslavement to freedom. Verses 1 to 7. Now, I should really say something about slavery in the first century and slavery in American history because they're not exactly the same. And so sometimes the associations of the word slave or slavery are different for us than they would have been for Paul. So forgive me a small excursus. The great scholar Thomas Sowell in his books on culture and slavery have pointed out that every major world culture had some kind of slavery until the evangelical awakening. So the Hittites had slaves. The Chinese had slaves. Egyptians had slaves. Europeans had slaves. Slavery was a de facto cultural phenomenon. But in the Roman Empire of Paul's day, you could become a slave in different ways. You could become a slave as a result of a raiding party or the result of being defeated in war, but you could become a slave because there were no bankruptcy protection laws. There was no chapter 11 or chapter 13. So if you borrowed some money, then the economy went belly up. You had no recourse but to sell yourself and perhaps your family into slavery. That's what you had to do. That meant that slaves were not identified with a particular race. So there were Jews who were slaves and Jews who were free and Jews who were noble. There were Italians who were slaves and Italians who were free and Italians who were noble. There were Africans who were slaves and Africans who were free and Africans who were noble and so on. There was no association of one race with slavery. It also meant that because some people became slaves through economic circumstances, slavery was not necessarily associated with the most menial tasks growing cotton or cutting sugar cane, because after all, it could be a first-class business person who went belly up economically, and he became a slave to somebody who might have had a lot less education and a lot less uh, smarts, but nevertheless had more money. And so as a result, some slaves were teachers and governesses and scholars and business people and, and, and so on, which is why, for example, in the parable of the talents, Paul, according to Jesus, the master consigns his goods, bags of gold to to his slaves, not just servants, slaves, according to his estimate of what they could do. And they are tasked with investing the money. So the particular thing that is common in all forms of slavery is that a slavery must do what he's told. And he can't get away without repercussions. He's a slave, and he can't get away. But apart from that, associate the nature of slavery with Roman practices in slavery rather than with the American history on the matter. That will make an important difference in a few moments. Now then, in these first two verses, first seven verses, there are two groups whom Paul considers to be slaves. Number one, minors are slaves. That is, those who are underage, who haven't reached their majority. What I am saying is that as long as an heir is underage, he is no different from a slave. In fact, slaves might be put in charge of such a person. After all, that was the point made at the end of chapter 3. Chapter 3, verse 23, before the coming of this faith, that is the appearance of Christ, we we Jews, were held in custody under the law, locked up until the faith that was to come would be revealed. So the law was our guardian until Christ came. Verse 25, now that this faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. So again, picking up here, what I am saying is that as long as an heir is underage, he's no different from a slave. He's got to do what he's told. He's under authority. He he may be the heir and in that sense, potentially the owner of the entire estate. But the heir is subject to guardians and trustees until the time set by his father. So also, 
when we were underage, we were in slavery until the elemental spiritual forces, under the elemental spiritual forces of the world. Now, what that expression means, I'll come back to in a moment. Second, not only are there minors who are slaves, there are slaves who are slaves. That is, the minors are not slaves in legal status. They're slaves in the sense that they have to do what they're told. But there are some people who are legally slaves, and they have to do what they're told as well. Hence, verse 6, because you are his sons. Now, Paul has been talking in the first person plural. In verse 4, when the time had fully come, God sent his son born under the law to redeem those under the law that we might receive adoption to sonship. We who are born under the law. Paul does not always use we for we Jews only. It depends on the context, but in this context, that's quite clear. We Jews who are under the law were under guardianship, slaves as it were. But you, you Gentiles, now Christians, who are his sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave. These people were never sons, minors who were acting like slaves. They were never under the law covenant. They, they didn't have titular right to the entire heritage. They did not belong to the household of God, but they were slaves. So, the point is that both groups of slaves, Jews who were minors, that is belonging to the household of God in some sense, but ordered around like slaves, plus Gentile slaves who never did belong to the household of God, both have now been set free. Hence verse 4, when the time had fully come, when the set time had fully come, God sent His Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law that we might receive adoption to sonship. When I was a student at seminary, we had a chap who loved the Apostle Paul teaching, and he, he loved this verse, when the set time had come, or when the time had fully come, in the King James Version under which I was reared. And he went through the long list of social historical circumstances that meant the gospel was ready to be circulated widely because in God's providence, the set time had fully come. There was the Pax Romana, the peace of Rome that preserved a great deal of territorial peace, reduced the number of skirmishes, it made it safer to travel. Uh, the Roman roads were spectacular. At no point in history until the 1800s were there such good roads in the uh, continent of Europe and beyond, uh, which meant the travel was a, a, a lot easier. And so all of these things were bound up together to the set time when it had fully come, then God sent His Son. Now the time is ripe for a great missionary outreach to the Gentiles. I, I somehow don't think Paul is conversing about Roman roads. They don't seem to be at the top of his agenda. Rather, it's the set time for the redemption that God has designed from the beginning. At this set time, God sends His Son. His Son becomes a human being. He comes born of a woman. He is incarnate. He becomes one of us. He is born under the law in all of its promise and limitations to redeem, to liberate those under the law. He comes as the Son now enslaved under the law to redeem those who are under the law so that they might receive the adoption of sons. When we hear the word adoption, we conjure up a mental picture of a couple deciding to adopt a three-month-old, two-week-old, six-month-old, perhaps a four- or five-year-old. But adoption in the ancient world was much more commonly bound up with uh, adopting adults. Uh, you recall that um, Abraham wanted to adopt, as it were, Elimelech and make him his son. And, um, and uh, when a, a man or a woman became a son or a daughter by adoption, then what was clear is they had all the rights and prerogatives and responsibilities and freedoms of a, of a natural born son. So, so what we're really being told is that, is that these slaves, whether Jews who are minors or Gentiles who never were part of the household of God, they are the ones who have now been made sons of the living God. 
So you are no longer a slave, but God's child. And since you are his child, God has made you also an heir. So here is the glory of turning from enslavement to freedom. Biblical Christianity is not to be confused with a bit of ritual and a lot of rules. Rather, it is associated with family relationship to the living God. In fact, there is an unmistakable allusion to the triune God. At the set time, God sent His Son. His Son became incarnate and redeemed us on the cross. And because you are His sons, God sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, the Spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. In the design of the triune God, not only God's purposes and intent and the effect of redemption by the Son and the application of it by the Spirit means the entire Godhead is bound up in the redemption of His people to enable us to escape slavery. Here is the glory of turning from enslavement to freedom. And it is such freedom precisely because of the work of the Spirit of God in our hearts. We want to be His children because of His gracious work in our lives. The, the, the same God has sent His Spirit so that in our own hearts we cry out, Abba, Father. How will I view that as slavery when there's nowhere else I would rather be? Of course there's constraint. We'll, we'll come to the constraint in due course, but this is, this is the freedom of the sons and daughters of the living God. Second, the misery of abandoning freedom for slavery. The long section, verses 8 to 20, has three parts. First, slavery renewed, verses 8 to 11. The basic argument in these verses is clear enough. Formerly, when you did not know God, addressing now the Gentile Christians, you were slaves to those who by nature are not gods. Oh, they had their gods, but they're not really gods. They're they're idols. But now that you know God, you've become Christians. And then Paul says rather tellingly, or rather are known by God. Which is more important? It is easy to think of our privileges. We know God. That is truly wonderful. But to be known by God such that God has poured out on His people the seal of the Spirit so as to say, this one is mine! This one is mine! Not only do we know God, but we're known by God. Now that you know God and are known by God, how is it that you are turning back to those weak and miserable forces? The same expression that is used in chapter 3. And therein lies a minor conundrum that we should think about. What are the elementary spiritual forces in verse 3 that are in some sense akin to the elementary forces in verses 8 and 9? The background in verse 3 is the law. The background in verses 8 and 9 is paganism. So how are we to label both backgrounds elementary spiritual forces? The expression rendered elementary spiritual forces in the text I'm using most commonly refers in the ancient world, in the Greco-Roman world, to the, the basic elements from which all matter is composed, air, fire, earth, water often associated in the pagan world with gods. 
So in their worship of false gods, of idols, they, they are attached to the basic elements of the world fed by the demonic in the pagan world. How does that apply to the Jewish background? One commentator writes, I think he's got it right, perhaps Paul wants to suggest that Gentiles under the stoicheia, the elementary forces, share with Jews under the law the same condition of living under a regime involving rules relating to material reality. And that together, these religious realities are all outmoded with the coming of Christ. The Old Testament law was tied so strongly to ritual, sacrifice, what you can eat, what you must not eat, what animals you may sacrifice, what you do with their kidneys, what you eat and what you burn and what you put outside the camp and this part the priest can eat and not other parts. And that's just the regular daily sacrifices, and throw in Yom Kippur and Passover, and what you do with the temple, who's allowed behind the veil, and on and on and on. It's a, it's a very tactile world. It's a, a material world. The, the basic structures of, of God's disclosing Himself in, in symbol-laden ways. And from Paul's understanding, that law was never designed in itself to save. It pointed forward to other things. So why would you want to go back to that which has been eclipsed by the coming of Christ any more than you'd want to go back to your paganism, which was tactile and re religious in its, in its rules and do's and don'ts and sacrificial systems and bound up with your perception of the physical universe and so on. Any more than you'd want to go to that slavery, why would you go to that slavery? They're not returning to paganism here with its false gods. They're returning to Judaism with its false gospel. Hence verse 10, you are observing special days and months and seasons and years. That is a strict Jewish calendar. Elsewhere, the issue of circumcision is strong. Chapter 5, verse 2, mark my words, I, Paul, tell you that if you let yourselves be circumcised, Christ will be of no value to you at all. Again, I declare to every man who lets himself be circumcised that he is obligated to obey the whole law. Circumcision marked, submission to, coming under the whole law. So, if you think that is necessary for your acceptability before God, then if you come under circumcision and covenantal commitment to the whole law, you are really saying that the sacrifice of Christ is inadequate or insufficient. It is not reliable. In some ways, it is deficient. What is being challenged is the exclusive sufficiency of the cross work of Christ. It's a new gospel, which as Paul says in chapter 1, is really no gospel at all. It's damning. In other words, Paul views their turn to Judaism to be spiritually equivalent to returning to paganism, abandoning the gospel. They are opting for slavery. Paul is personally devastated by this, verse 11, I fear for you that some I have, somehow I have wasted my efforts on you. I was in communication with a young man in the last week who is on the cusp of doing something hugely unbiblical. And his question was, yeah, but aren't you interested in our happiness? Well, of course I am. I'm interested in your ultimate happiness, your happiness for this life and for the life to come. But if you decide what you can and can't do on the basis of your current feelings about what will make you happy, 
you're actually selling yourself to a kind of slavery. And you make people around you who love you and who care about the truth of the gospel equally miserable, as Paul is made miserable. Here, I fear for you, he says. Second, not only slavery renewed, but slavery made attractive, verses 12 to 16. Somehow these Galatians have been snookered into adopting a regimen of religion, of Judaism, as the basis of their acceptance before God, and there are two results. First, a skewed theology, verse 12. I plead with you, brothers and sisters, become like me, for I became like you. Now, all, Paul often says that he wants people to imitate him. But usually when he says such things, the context shows that he's got certain ethical or fundamental uh, Christian values in mind. For example, in 2 Timothy chapter 4, when he's telling Timothy how to act, you, however, know about, about my teaching, my way of life, my purpose, my faith, my patience, my love, my endurance, persecutions, sufferings, what kinds of things happened to me in Antioch. The persecutions I endured, the Lord rescued me from all of them. So that's what you're to imitate in me. Here, what is he talking about? Become like me because I became like you. That is, he abandoned the law as the way by which righteousness before God is to be pursued and attained. He abandoned it and thus became like Gentiles who don't have the law. So is the first thing that they're supposed to do now to go back to the law that Paul himself abandoned? They have a skewed theology. This is the first explicit command given to the Galatian readers in this book, and it is designed to help them avoid a skewed theology. Second, a skewed relationship, verses 13 to 16. Why Paul arrived on their doorstep ill, we cannot possibly know. F.F. F. Bruce guesses that as the apostle hit the southern shore of what is now southern Turkey, it's swampy land, mosquitoes, malaria, that kind of thing, he might have picked up malaria. And in those days, the uh, treatment for malaria without any drugs that we have today was to go to the high hills, go to the cooler air, the fresher air and away from the mosquitoes. And of course, the Galatians lived up in the hills. So, that may be the case. You know it was because of an illness that I first preached the gospel to you. That's what got me there. And even though my illness was a trial to you, if it is something like malaria, it can go on for a long, long time. It can, of course, kill you. But you did not treat me with contempt or scorn. As, as Paul preached, even in his weakness and illness, you welcomed me as if I were an angel of God. Oh, another angel. These, this angel, at least, is not preaching a false gospel as the angels in Galatians chapter 1 are preaching a false gospel. You accepted me as an angel of God, as if I were Christ Jesus Himself. But now, apparently, you've changed your theology so much you want to distance yourself from me. I, I can testify that at one time that's not the way it was. Y you would have gladly torn out your eyes for me. There is an old legend that Paul had very, very bad sight and and so his illness was bound up with bad sight. That's possible. We have no way of proving it. Or it might just be a manner of speaking. I, I testify you would have given me anything. You would have given me your own eyeballs. Anything to help me. But have I now become your enemy by telling you the truth? So somehow these people have found the slavery so attractive that they can reject not only the gospel, but the one who brought them the gospel. You don't interact with Christian families very long or Christian churches very long before you see things like that. And then slavery made seductive, verses 17 to 20. The wretched situation is depicted in verses 17 and 18, Paul's agonizing response in verses 19 and 20. It hasn't come about by these people just thinking about these things, as it were, but there are false teachers involved. Those people are zealous to win you over. Sometimes you get a lot of baby Christians and they're easily seduced. They're seduced by people who are smarmy, flattering, with a lot of biblical proof texts and not much biblical theology. 
And one of the things they always try to do is to turn you aside from any sort of allegiance to the one who has taught you the gospel in the first place. Oh, it's good to be zealous. They, they, they really pour it on. But zeal can't be evaluated properly unless you evaluate its purpose. Hitler was zealous. So likewise in theology and pastoral care, some people are zealous with very questionable motives. Everything must be tested finally by the gospel. What they want is to alienate you from us so that you may have zeal for them, not for the truth, not for testing things like the Bereans to see if these things are so. They want to alienate you from us so that you can be tied in allegiance to them. There are some forms of spiritual direction and spiritual preaching and teaching and so on that ultimately want to build a camp of loyalty much more than they want to plumb the depths of the gospel in the Word of God. It's fine to be zealous, Paul says, provided the purpose is good and to be so always, to be consistent in this regard, not just when I am with you. And then you feel Paul's pain, my dear children, for whom I am again in the pains of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. How I wish I could be with you now and change my tone because I am perplexed about you. This is not some cool professional evangelist. He recognizes that sometimes in the preaching and teaching of the gospel, it's like a woman giving birth. It can be so painful. And now the child is here and suddenly you discover maybe the child's not born after all. You start pushing again and you have a kind of perpetual childbirth because you're not sure whether the child is here or not. It's, it's almost a bizarre metaphor, but it shows how deeply Paul is in agony. How I wish I could be with you now and change my tone because I am perplexed about you. He couldn't send a text message and arrange a time to get on Skype and so sort of see face to face and have a better assessment of where they are. He didn't have some of the advantages of instantaneous communication that we have. Paul wishes he could be there. Give them a hug. Decide whether it's better to issue a rebuke or encouragement to pray with them or against them. Hence, we look at all of the misery of abandoning the freedom of the gospel for slavery. And finally, the biblical clarity that contrasts slavery and freedom, verses 21 to 31. Often these verses are presented as a great problem. But from Paul's perspective, he is deploying a biblical argument to convince his readers from the Bible of the truth of the gospel. Let me direct your attention back again to verse 21. Tell me, you who want to be under the law, are you not aware of what the law says? Verse 30, but what does Scripture say? So when people find something that is often called allegorical and are embarrassed by what is widely perceived to be questionable exegesis, a bit spongy, then we sort of smile and say, well, you know, it's Paul and he had the gift of the Spirit, so he could say that that's what it meant, but we can't do the same. Or we say, well, it's allegorical, it's figurative, it's a, it's a bit spacey. If, but it's, it must be an ad hominem argument. He uses that argument not because um, that's what Paul really thinks or that's the way Paul would really handle the Scripture. Um, he uses that argument because he knows that that's the kind of argument that they would appreciate. So he's lowered the bar to their level of intellectual attainment. That simply won't account for verse 21 and verse 30. Paul is arguing from Scripture. He's rebuking them for not seeing what he sees in Scripture. 
The crucial phrase, of course, that is so hard to translate is in verse 24. The King James Version says, which things are allegorical? The ESV says, now this may be interpreted allegorically. The NIV says, these things are being taken figuratively. Part of the problem is with the word allegory. In Greek, it's hatenasin allegoromena. Allegoromena is from the verb allegoreo, from which we get the word allegory. But allegory in the ancient world didn't mean exactly what it means to us today. It was a word that covered all kinds of different things. There is one kind of allegory that this is most certainly not. It was a kind used by Philo in the first century, roughly a contemporary of Paul. Philo was a Jew living in Alexandria. He wrote voluminously, and um, in his exposition, for example, of the patriarchs on Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, he, he sees that these men are historical figures, but he says that Abraham is a symbol of virtue gained by learning. Isaac is a symbol of innate virtue. And Jacob is a symbol of virtue attained by practice. So the three primal patriarchs represent three fundamentals in a good Greek education. Now, with the best will in the world, I can't find that in Genesis 11 and following, especially 15 to 21. I, 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 I can't find it. Allegory in that sense depends on an external interpretive grid. In other words, the key to finding that interpretation in that kind of allegory is not in the text itself. It depends on an external grid. That's not what Paul is doing here. Paul is not saying, now let me give you a key that will explain everything. I'm just going to draw this out from some other notion and apply it to the text. He's not saying that. He's saying, it's in the Bible. Read the Bible. It's there. But allegory in the ancient world can be figurative language. It can be figurative in many different kinds of ways. The ESV, as I've said, says this may be interpreted allegorically, but strictly speaking, Paul does not say this may be interpreted allegory, but may not be, it so sort of depends. That's one option. He's not saying that. He says these things are allegorumena. These things are another way of saying something, but they're saying it. And so what is it exactly that Paul is finding in the biblical text that he expects us to find too? What he finds is a pattern of pairs, a pattern that is there in the text. Verses 21 to 23, two sons and two women. Tell me, you who want to be under the law, are you not aware of what the law says? For it is written, Abraham had two sons, one by the slave woman, the other by the free woman, two sons two women, one son associated with one woman, one son associated with the other. His son by the slave woman, Ishmael, was born according to the flesh, that is, naturally. The son by the free woman was born as the result of a divine promise. Now, it wasn't a miraculous virgin birth or anything like that, but it was the result of a divine promise. So now you've got the two pairs. Where does the argument go from here? Well, these things are symbol-laden. These things are, I'm almost likely to say, typological. These things are in the text, but there's a structure you need to see. The women represent two covenants. That is, they represent two covenants because they are part of a consistent patterning of pairs in Scripture. One covenant is from Mount Sinai and bears children who are to be slaves. This is Hagar. And you say, oh, whoa, 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 wait a minute. The, the Jews, the, the inheritance of Abraham through Isaac, they're the ones that went to Mount Sinai. Isn't this twisting things? 
And Paul says, well, historically, that's, that, that's correct, but back off and watch the pairing. Watch, watch where the pairs go. Hagar stands for Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to the present city of Jerusalem because she is in slavery with her children, but the Jerusalem that is above is free. And you start, wait a minute, two Jerusalems? And then you start remembering how often the Scriptures speak about Jerusalem on the one hand, empirically sinful, corrupt, foul, idolatrous. Go back and reread sections of Isaiah and Ezekiel and Jeremiah, the Jerusalem that is damned, the Jerusalem that will be destroyed, the Jerusalem where the temple will be raised. And then on the other hand, the promise of another Jerusalem where there's singing and dancing and righteousness reigns so spectacularly over the top, anticipating the glory yet to come, that ultimately even Jews in the intertestamental period started speaking of that as the heavenly Jerusalem or the Jerusalem that is from above. It's the Jerusalem that God gives because it sure isn't being worked out by us Jews on the ground until finally you have the revelation of the new Jerusalem, hinted at in Hebrews 12, explicitly alluded to here, fleshed out in Revelation 21. There's a pairing. There's a pairing of the old Jerusalem, which is under the curse, and the promise of the new Jerusalem. And don't you see, he says? That, that old Jerusalem is bound up with the curse of being under the law covenant. And he is building his connections here on the basis of what he said in chapter 3. What's the new covenant here? What's the covenant that is presupposed here? It's not the covenant of Jeremiah. It's the Abrahamic covenant. In chapter 3, the argument runs something like this. Many conservative Palestinian Jews in the first century, if they were asked the question, how do you please God, would answer, by obeying the law. How does Daniel please God? Well, so far as he can do it, by obeying the law. How does Isaiah please God? By obeying the law. How does, how, how does David please God? By obeying the law. How does Moses please God? By obeying the law. How does Abraham please God? By obeying the law. Oh, wait, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute. How can you say Abraham obeys the law? And they quote Exodus, he obeyed my statutes. So he must have had some sort of private revelation of the law. How, how does Enoch please God? Well, it's, 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 it says he walked with God. We know that how you walk with God is by obeying the law. He must have had some special revelation of the law to please God. And what is happening then is that the law is being elevated to a point of hermeneutical control. You're reading the whole Bible through the law. And today we have scholars looking at Deuteronomistic history saying the same sort of thing. Cursed is the one who does that. Blessed is the one who does that. Cursed is the one who does that. Blessed is the one who does that. Cursed is the one who does that. Blessed is the one who does that. That's Deuteronomistic theology, we're told. It shows that it all depends on how you respond to the law. And then you forget that the book of Deuteronomy ends up by not even Moses getting into the promised land. What this law does is show that it doesn't work. It's good, as Paul says elsewhere, but it's not powerful. It's good, but it's not transforming. It's prophetic, but it's not intrinsically transforming and life-generating. Don't you see? No, 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 no. The, the other covenant, the, the covenant that is not associated with Hagar, but that is associated with Sarah, is the Abrahamic covenant, which is fulfilled in the new covenant, in the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's the covenant of promise. Do you see, the Bible has many different ways of pointing forward to the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. Specific predictions, like Jeremiah 31 and his promise of a new covenant, or Micah 5.2 announcing that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. Then there are huge typological patterns, all of the things that are said about the temple until Jesus comes in John 2 and says, 
that He is Himself the temple, the great meeting place between God and sinful people. All the things that are said about priest and sacrifice, Day of Atonement, Passover, Jesus, Paul writes to the Corinthians and says, Christ our Passover has been sacrificed for us. So many different ways of anticipating what is yet to come in typology, in predictions, in the sequence argument of Galatians 3. What Paul says there is, you cannot elevate the law to this supreme place, the grid by which you understand everything, because before the law was given, the Abrahamic promise was given, and the promise is not annulled by the arrival of the law. The promise is the promise. The promise of, uh, of the Abrahamic covenant must be fulfilled. And what you have done is elevated the law to a controlling lens. And what I'm telling you is if you read your Bible sequentially, Paul says, then you discover that it points to the fulfillment of the Abrahamic promise in the coming of Christ. And one of the ways that the Bible points forward, Paul here says, is there is a pattern of pairings. A pattern of pairings. And once you see this, it stands out and leaps at you. It was partly what enabled Luther to think as clearly as he did about the antithesis between law and grace. So, to which of these pairs will you attach yourself, your hopes, your dreams, your identity? On which side will you ground your confidence? On which side does freedom lie, the glorious freedom of the sons of God? Let me wrap these things together in three or four strands very quickly. Number one, the freedom from slavery that Paul envisages is freedom from relying on the law or on anything else, religious or ir irreligious, as the ground of our acceptance before God, including our devotions, coming to a TGC conference, or boasting with a Pharisee, I'm not like other men are, Anything of that sort as the ground of our acceptance before God. We need freedom from such slavery. Number two, this is quite unlike what many in the Western world of the 21st century mean by freedom, where freedom is bound up with self-chosen, self-constructed identities in order to establish our authentic living. It's important to recognize that this kind of choice issues in the most vulgar and punishing slavery of all. And finally, it damns us. No, 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 no. The freedom that we are offered here is the transforming freedom that makes our hearts burn within us as we hear the words of the resurrected Christ. We understand those along the Emmaus Road who said, were not our hearts burning within us while He talked with us along the way? The gospel comes and gives us freedom because it's such a blessed slavery. Third, indeed, one of the great metaphors for Christian maturity, for sanctification and so on, for being a follower of Christ is that we become slaves of Christ. When Paul calls himself in most of our English translations, Paul a servant of Jesus Christ, in virtually every place, a word is used that really means slave. Paul a slave of Jesus Christ. And some of this is best caught in old hymns. Redeemed, liberated, I love to proclaim it. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Or make me a captive Lord, and then I shall be free. Force me to render up my sword, and I shall conquer be. I sink through life's alarms when by myself I stand. Imprison me within your arms, and strong will be my hand. Let us pray. Work by your powerful spirit within us, Lord God, so that we fear, indeed hate, the slavery of sin, the slavery of self-reliance, the slavery of religious reliance, the slavery of self-constructed identities, and grant us instead 
the wonderful liberty of the sons and daughters of God, which is tied up with unfailing allegiance to the Lord Christ Himself. We bless you that He became one of us, a slave, to give us the adoption of sons. Grant that our hearts may burst with gratitude and adoration. For Jesus' sake, amen.